Welcome to the College of Natural Nutrition. In this DVD, I'm going to be introducing you to many different techniques. And for me, they really are the most important part of what I practice. Over the several decades of practicing, I've just found them to be uniquely powerful. You have a booklet which has all of the techniques printed in it. And so what I would like you to do right now is to read the first seven pages. And that will give you a really gentle understanding of what we're going to be discussing in the DVD. The first technique we're going to look at is skin brushing. And if we just bear in mind that with techniques, we're actually wanting to either create movement in stagnant areas, or we may be wanting to bring heat to cold areas, or we may be wanting just to introduce energy into very low energy areas. And so the first technique that I'm going to be speaking about, as I say, is skin brushing. You just need a very simple back brush, which has bristles of um, a hardness where you can actually feel it, but it's not painful. So you don't want it so soft that it's just going to stroke you. The purpose of the skin brushing is firstly to remove the scurf rim. So you do it on dry skin. So you do it before you're going to do your cleansing. And it can be done in the morning or in the evening. So you just brush onto your dry skin to remove the top layer of skin because in that top layer of skin is toxicity, acidity. So if you remove that, you have room for the next area. And your skin is your largest area of elimination. So it's a very important organ to work on. It's very easy then because you don't force toxicity through other parts of your body, like through the kidneys, through the liver or through the lungs. And you'll see in your booklet some diagrams which will describe to you the way to do it. So starting at your feet, just gentle brushing movements up each leg, front and back, brushing up to your heart, because here you have your main lymph feeds. So the lower part of your torso up to your heart, front and back, then start at your hands, and your neck and brush downwards to this area again until you've covered the whole of your body. Just gently brushing. So this is going to remove that scurf rim, but it's going to do more. The lymphatic system doesn't have a pump like the blood supply, having the heart to pump it. So in this gentle brushing, just very gently, the lymph will move under very minimal pressure, you're actually encouraging the lymphatic system to move. You can see that this would be a very easy technique to apply to somebody who can't move. So if you have somebody with a very stagnant picture, like the ME picture, it can be applied by a second party, maybe in the morning, and also, it's a wonderful way to start your day. You're out of bed, things are not moving terribly quickly, and so some skin brushing could be your beginning of the day. So just simple back brush. Keep it just for your skin brushing. Don't let the rest of the family get hold of it and start putting soap, etc., on it. Just keep it exclusively for that. And do remember, do it on dry skin. After we've looked at the skin brushing, we are going to look now at hot and cold showering. Again, something that's very easy to apply in your own home. Hot and cold showering is actually going to magnify the effect of the skin brushing. So a beautiful sequence is to do your skin brushing on your dry skin and then go for hot and cold showering. The principle behind this is that 
when you heat your body up, the blood is drawn to the surface to cool you down. And when you do that, when the blood moves to the surface, the lymph will follow. Then when you make your body colder, the blood will go deeper to warm the vital organs and the lymph will follow suit. So do your wash in the shower after your body brushing. And then at the end, I would suggest that you flip it three times. So you go to cold three times. So you've done your shower, go cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, finishing on cold. And I always say the college does not hand out medals for being really tough. So in other words, don't make it ridiculously hot and don't make it ridiculously cold. Start with just a small difference in the temperature and build it up so that it's more extreme. Because remember, you're going to get things moving in your body and you don't want to do that very abruptly. But that's an amazing way to start the day. Lymph will be moving, skin will be fresh, and what might have taken you quite a long time is already achieved. And when you think of people who can't get around, they can't go for the morning walk or walk to the station or whatever most people do. So you need to try to create that movement, remembering that illness is actually stagnation. So very simple, but very, very effective. Then let's look at hot and cold tubbing. And here we're taking the hot and cold showering deeper. The beautiful work of Douglas Lewis, where he realized the deeper issues with something like AIDS were this cold body. And we know um, where people have lost the ability to have an acute manifestation, we need to bring that back. So think of children in childhood, they do amazing fevers and down it goes again, body clears. <clears throat> so our hot and cold tubbing is going to be a way of implementing that. So all you need is a good hot water supply and your bathtub. I would suggest that you don't do this after a large meal. Or, you know, it's often better to do it before. It's good to do it before going to bed because then you can just go there to relax. So run hot water into the bath and you will need a thermometer because you're going to watch your body temperature because the whole point of the hot and cold tubbing is to elevate it. You need to keep your head cool because remember in fevers, the main thing is keep from the nape of the neck to the head cool. So a towel with cold water would work very, very well. Submerge yourself in the bath, taking your body temperature, take it under your tongue and allow the temperature to come up to 102 degrees. That's 102 degrees Fahrenheit. <clears throat> then only put up with it for as long as is comfortable. Again, no medals handed out. So the first time you do it, you may find 10 minutes is your limit. So be in the bath, relax for that amount of time. You may need to have a second person adding some hot water because a lot of baths don't have enough hot water. Then when you finish that, allow the hot water to drain away and let the cold run in. So you have this gradual changeover from hot to cold. And then ideally you're going to soak in the cold again for as long as is comfortable. And the remarkable thing is so many people prefer the cold to the hot. And what you can do is gradually expand these times out. So a bit longer in the hot, a bit longer in the cold. Then come out of the bath. You can either dry yourself with your hands to get friction or 
just towel yourself and go to bed. Now, what is going to happen there is that the body, your body, will produce heat from deep inside you. Latent heat will be produced. And this will permeate through all of the organs out to the surface. This is so deep and so beneficial. So any stagnation deep down is going to be removed. You do need to check that your body temperature is coming up. Um, you know, if you've got a second person observing, you know, some woolly socks or a woolly hat, but, you know, the majority of people go to bed and start to bring their temperature up. So here, we're reversing the story where the person has a low body temperature and we know that when the body temperature is down, cell membranes thicken, lymph thickens, all the movements in the body become difficult. And healing is about creating freedom and movement on all levels and the manifestation in the physical body is so, so important. Now, we're going to deepen the effect of the hot and cold tubbing. We're going to add an extra dimension to this. So that was just in hot water, in cold water, going to bed. If we feel that people have a lot of trouble with their lymphatics, you know, maybe they have an appendix that keeps rumbling, um, or maybe they're troubled with adhesions, you can then have an extra part to the technique. And this is a really ancient one. To the hot tubbing, remember always to keep the head cool. So make sure you're checking the thermometer. Bring the temperature up to 102. Stay in the hot tub as long as is comfortable. Remember, have sips of body temperature water available. And then after you've had enough of that, come out, sit on the edge of the bath. And then you wrap yourself in a piece of material. Now, what you do, I would suggest you half the size of a single sheet, is before you do the hot tubbing, wet this material. Put it under the cold tap and wet it and pop it in the freezer. Ideal again if you have a second party, second person helping you. So you've been in your hot tubbing, you've come out of it, you're very, very hot, you're sitting on the edge of the bath, you're keeping your head cool, and then with this cold, damp piece of material, wrap your body in it, ideally from under your arms to your groin, but on the other hand, if people have problems with shoulders or neck, then you'd want to bring it up above there. So wrap your body in that so that it's cold and damp. Then you go into bed, having prepared it so that you're not going to ruin the mattress, and go into bed and wait for your body to warm up. Now, the latent heat is going to have more demands to be produced so, because it's going to want to warm up and dry this cloth. So it's a very deep treatment to apply that cold, damp wrap for all night. So the hot tubbing, last thing at night, wrapped in the cold sheet and into bed. Again, very, very important to check that the body temperature is coming up. And again, you know, at the beginning, it may be used for a short period of time. And personally, I've seen some quite remarkable results with this, where people have had a lot of pain, and this has relieved it and they've slept well. Equally, if people have this problem with the appendix area blocking, where you find that the sheet is discolored in the morning. So you've had this removal of congestion from the lymphatic system coming out through the skin and being absorbed onto the cloth.
very ancient, extremely powerful. But I would suggest that you try to have a second person to help you do this. And I do suggest under the arms and to the groin so that you don't trip yourself up if you're moving around on your own. This will certainly have the effect of a full-blown fever, which often is what we need to resolve a story. You know, with the ME pictures, where so frequently the person started with an unresolved fever, and each day they feel that it would be wonderful to do it. They may have residual chest problems that just won't go away. You know, the irritating cough. To elevate their temperature might be just what they need. Now, let's move on to the next technique in the booklet, sitz baths. Really ancient. Now, what I'm very aware is we want to conserve water. And so I would suggest that you purchase um, something larger than this. Get yourself a baby bath, you know, just a plastic baby bath, and put it beside your main bath. Because what we're going to want to do is move from hot water to cold water without um, throwing away either of them. So this is ideal to bring energy to the pelvic area where women have um, reproductive issues, men have prostatic problems, or the bowel is sluggish, or the bladder is not as um, responsive as it should be, and the tension. So sit spas, very easy to do and very helpful. So have something like a plastic baby bath or plastic laundry basket. Put a good amount of cold water in it, not so that it will overflow when you sit in it, and it needs to be big enough for you to sit in it with your knees up, so you're sitting in that way. Five inches of hot water in your main bath. So sit there for several minutes. You can splash the hot water around you. Then get out and sit in the cold bath. Again, splash the water around you. And alternate that maybe up to five times. And you'll find that energy is drawn to this area and as I say, tone with muscles will be drawn because you're going to have relaxation and contraction. Very easy way to do it. Then just towel dry. And it's easy to do that two or three times a week. You can do it at any time in the day. Nextly, I'm going to look at the Epsom salt bath. Now, what I tend to do is keep a tub of Epsom salts because what you need is to have commercial Epsom salts. So don't go buying the little tiny. So here we've got, you know, the fine crystals, the magnesium sulfate. You know, go to a garden center um, or a farming center but get yourself a good size bag of commercial Epsom salts. In the chemist, they don't tend to have it now, <clears throat> and they just have little tiny boxes. So, what are we doing with the Epsom salts? We're wanting to do two things. We want to draw toxicity through the skin. But there's also another very valuable aspect to Epsom salt baths. In our body, we need to be able to convert sulfur to sulfate. And you find in certain conditions, particularly like autism, this doesn't happen. There are many conditions where it doesn't happen these days. And the sulfur is in the form of sulfate with the Epsom salts. And so if we wish to soothe somebody, particularly, as I say, children who are suffering with autism, it can be a very, very soothing experience. So put warm water in the bath, make it nice and warm, but not to the point where you're going to want to get out quickly. 
and into the bath put one kilo of the commercial Epsom salts and let them dissolve. So it's quite a strong solution. Then go into the bath for 20 minutes. Again, if you feel more comfortable keeping your head cool, just apply something. But this one isn't done to elevate your temperature enormously. This is done really to draw out through the skin and to be very soothing. In there, 20 minutes, don't put anything in there, don't put any soap or anything like that in. And then, just after the 20 minutes, shower down to take the Epsom salts away from the skin and the best time again is evening um, before bed then go to bed relax and sleep. I mean some people might like to combine using the Epsom salts in, in also doing the hot tubbing for the temperature but a very very soothing detoxing process Epsom salt baths and sulfur is so important in the whole detoxing function of the body. Very, very powerful. So you will draw toxicity through the skin and have this very soothing, sedating effect. And also introducing sulfur in the sulfate form to be drawn through the skin. So it has several purposes. Epsom salt baths work very well in the winter. You know, to do one a week for three consecutive weeks and have a week off is a nice way of making sure that in the stagnant darker times that you're detoxing really really well. Now we're very aware that a lot of people may only have shower cabinets and so we need to look at other ways of achieving our um, effect with things like Epsom salts. So the next area that is very good to work on in the body is the feet. The feet are a great area for drawing through. So just a simple plastic cheap washing up bowl is all that you need. Make it big enough obviously for your feet um, so that you can sit comfortably and putting them in. So everything virtually that we could apply in the bathtub we can apply to the feet. Now, you may well have an elderly person and, you know, or somebody who has a disability and can't get into a bath would be much more comfortable sitting in an armchair and you may wish to elevate their temperature. So an ideal way, feet in a nice warm foot bath, and this could just be hot water if you wish, and put them under a blanket. So place a blanket over the head, make a little tent around the chair. And again, you may want to apply something to keep the head and the neck cool. And they can sit there and bring up a nice temperature and fever. Remember the thermometer. And so you can do that, as I say, just with warm water. Ideal at the beginning of treating somebody with ME where it would be just too much effort to get them into a bathtub, or, as I say, if you don't have a bathtub. Then, going on from just hot water, you can start to add other ingredients into the foot bath. Epsom salts, perfect. So, exactly what we were talking about with the Epsom salt bath, Epsom salt foot bath. And, you know, it's quicker and easier if you want to apply it that way. So that's a very, very powerful foot bath. And also, you know, the old fashioned mustard bath. And you can use that. But also later in this DVD, I'm going to be talking to you about urine therapy. And you can also put urine in a foot bath. Again, the soles of the feet have a very powerful drawing. The soles of the feet, palms of the hand, and the face and neck. So that would be very, very useful to put in there. So we've got just warm water, we've got the mustard foot bath, and we've got the Epsom salt, um, uh, Epsom salt, 
uh, foot bath and as I've just mentioned, a urine foot bath. Also, you can add, after you've heated up, you'll see that I've mentioned a cold foot wrap. Now, if you cool the feet, it's like doing the hot and cold. But there's something extra you can do with a cold foot wrap. You know, if you go to bed and your mind is hideously active, you know, you've been doing something far too stimulating towards the end of the day, or you know somebody else in this situation. With a large percentage of people, it's helpful if when they realize they can't sleep, is to go downstairs and put on a pair of cotton socks. And these cotton socks, they will have made wet, you know, damp, and have put in the fridge. So they're going to put on these cold, damp socks and then a nice pair of woolen socks over the top and go back to bed. And the way this works is that the blood supply, which is keeping the brain far too active for sleep, will be directed to the feet to warm them up and dry the socks. So you're diverting the energy away from the head. You're diverting um, some of the blood supply and the heat away from the head so that it can go to sleep and feet are warming up. It can be quite a useful thing to do. The next technique in your booklet is the castor oil packing. This must be so ancient, but more recently it's based on the work of Edgar Cayce. And the principles behind it I don't think are totally understood unless you really um, are moving into understanding how light works in the body. And the Castor oil plant is called the Palma Christi and it grows in warm climates where there's a lot of light. And what we do know is that it is white light, its colour, its emission is the full spectrum of light castor oil. It's a saturated fat, so it's very, very stable, saturated oil. So you don't really have to keep it in the fridge. So here we're using um, an oil from a very hot country where there's a huge amount of light. And so we're going to use it where we wish to shed a lot of light in our body. And there's a golden rule about castor oil packing. You must always firstly pack your liver. And this has a good logic because this should be the main route out. So you wish to open up this main route out before you start opening up other areas that are going to release. This is very much what was described at the beginning of your booklet. So what do we need? We need a piece of unbleached fabric and classically this piece of fabric is 27 inches by 12. And it can either be folded into three thicknesses or two. And what I suggest you do is that you place it on something like your draining board where it doesn't matter if it gets oily. So place it on your draining board, then take your bottle of castor oil and just trickle it over the surface of the material. Yeah. Then fold the material over so that you can rub it to impregnate the material. So that when you pick up your pack, it's oily, but it's not dripping. Now this pack, you can use up to about 40 times. And when you need to, just impregnate it with some more castor oil. So we're gonna keep it in between packing up to about 40 times. I actually suggest you bin it then because if you put it in your washing machine, I just find they're just so messy. So here we've got our pack. We're ready to use it. So we want to apply it where it covers the liver. So as I say, whatever 
thickness. Now apply it to the liver area firstly. Then put something to keep the oil in. Could be a dustbin liner or something like that. And then I would suggest you put a piece of old clothing. Then we need a hot water bottle. Place that hot water bottle against your liver area. So remember your liver's tucked under your right ribs. So have it going round the side. Put your hot water bottle on there and sit and relax. Because for 90% of people, this is such a relaxing process and therefore would be better done in the evening. After the hour, remove the hot water bottle. And if you're sitting relaxing, I suggest you leave the pack in situ. So remember, this is always the first area you go to. Then, when you finish, just take it off, fold it, put it into something like a Tupperware container and put it in a larder or something. I wouldn't say the fridge. It's so stable and it will be so cold when you come to use it again. Clean yourself off and you're ready then, if you so wish, to pack another area. So what we'll often say is put this pack on so that the liver is in it, underneath it, and if the person is having lung problems or um, breast problems, put it so that you've got the liver and the breast and the lungs under it. So you can put the hot water bottle on the liver and you're also treating the upper part of the torso. Equally, you could put it low down so that you've got the hot water bottle on the liver area and you're covering the bowel and the reproductive area. So you're doing what you're supposed to do by treating the liver, plus you're applying this energy to this other part of the body. This is such a powerful technique. It gets things moving so much in that area and of course is amazing for the liver. Remember, the liver will regenerate. It's a very resilient organ and castor oil packing is so, so good for it. There are just a few things that we need to remember when we're using castor oil packing because it sets up movement. You know, we might be packing the liver and an elbow or the liver and an ankle or a knee. Is that when we apply it, we're creating movement. And it needs to be observed with great caution if somebody is suffering from blood pressure because the movement might be too much. So that if you're wanting to test it out for that, I suggest, you know, you only put it on for 10 minutes and just observe. Equally, because there's a huge amount of movement, you may need to follow with another technique because I think what you're going to be understanding by the end of the DVD, that often one technique will lead to another. So what you're doing is you're following the movement. So, you know, if you're releasing from organs that have been very stagnant for some time, then we may need to help the liver even more. So we may, the next morning, for example, need to do an enema. So castor oil packing, so amazing for getting movement in lymph, you know, where there are any hardened breast lumps or um, enlarged lymph nodes in the groin, in the occipital area of the neck, up in the, um, under the arms, all of those areas. And remember that here is the main feed of the lymphatic system. So very simple and quick. You can, if you wish, keep the pack on overnight. So treat the liver firstly, and then you can leave it in situ, you know, put a bath towel or something in the bed to make absolutely sure that you don't stain it. But if you do get castor oil on anything, get one of those thick, slimy washing up fluids and squeeze it into the oily area and then put it in the washing machine and it will come out. The next part of your booklet, you will see we're going to be looking at enemas. And this perhaps might be the most ancient technique 
that we're going to discuss, perhaps other than urine therapy. So what do we need and what is it going to do? Firstly, let me show you just a very, very simple enema bucket. So here we have a container and what we need to be able to do is to hang this container so that it's a meter, the bottom of the container is about a meter above where we're going to lie. So that it, this is a gravity feed enema bucket, so you want that head of water or whatever other fluid. You use the small nozzle because they frequently come with a vaginal douche, but simply set it up. And generally speaking, the tubing is soft enough for you to be able to squeeze to occlude the movement of fluid. Right, let's just firstly look at a water enema. If you've never done an enema before, I suggest that you use just clean body temperature water. Remember that if you make something fractionally warmer than body temperature, it will sedate the bowel. And if you make it fractionally cooler, it will stimulate it. So you have that ability. And you know, if you're not sure about body temperature, put your finger in and you shouldn't be able to really feel the water. It's the same as your finger. So a water enema could be used to evacuate the bowel. But you know, if you're moving the bowel, you're also going to be stimulating the reflexes in the colon that refer to the whole body. So as I say, you can use it just to clean out the colon um, or to create movement when stagnation has occurred. Two pints, just have a jug, um, just an ordinary jug where you can measure about two pints. And as I say, make that water to body temperature. Then go into your bathroom, hang up your enema bucket or enema bag, lubricate the rectal area, put the water into your enema bucket and then allow the air to be released. Then some people will just apply the, um, the nozzle of the enema kit while they're standing up. Others lie down. If you lie on your back with your knees up, you've got two spare hands. So let that water flow into your bowel and massage it as it's going in. Now, it's a good um, determining factor for people whether they can hold it or not. You may think, mm, two pints, rather a lot. I'll reduce it to one and a half pints, or in some cases, just a pint. Just leave it in for a few minutes and then go to the loo. And that may be your first experience of an enema. So you can adjust the quantity. Also, using the water enema, you may use it to proceed other kinds of enemas that we're going to talk about. Another hint is that you may like to apply your enema whilst you're in a bath of warm water. So just as you would take a bath, just in there, relaxing. And what it will do is it takes the pressure off the, abdo off the abdominal muscles so there isn't this um, urge to push it out. Because some of the other enemas you don't want to just put in and let out again, you actually want to hold it in there for a time. So very simple, do that as your first um, experience. The feeling that you're going to develop a flu or everything isn't quite right, things are beginning to feel quite stagnant, which often happens in the middle of winter. Now we've talked about Epsom salt baths, we've talked about hot tubbing, but another technique that can work very well is to do three water enemas in fairly quick succession. Because remember, any movement created down here in the colon area is going to impact 
on the whole of the lymphatic system. You know, for those of you who've looked at iridology, you see that the colon has references out from it to all of the body. So these three water enemas, ideally you'd have your three containers with two pints of clean body temperature water in. Go into your bathroom or wherever is convenient to do it and you let the first enema in, massage so that the water moves around. You can even take a tennis ball if you like and rub it across your belly. Then go and evacuate that. Then put a second one in. Do the same and evacuate that. And then put a third one in and you could leave that in for longer. And then go again to empty your bowel. And what a lot of people find is that they do that in the morning and repeat it in the evening. This sort of stagnant, you know, blocked head feeling of I'm going to develop a fever um, and I'm going to be ill. It actually helps the mo to create the movement which no longer requires the fever. So remember that the fever actually creates movement by um, quickening the movement know, right down to the subatomic particles, but with the water, you're actually stimulating things to get going again. And you can do it morning, night, morning, if you so wish. But keeping movement here, very, very important. And in your booklet, you'll see that I've mentioned several different sorts of enemas. And the next one, would be to use aloe vera. And aloe vera is an anti-inflammatory. It also has a cooling effect on the body. So you can imagine that aloe vera could be very good for inflamed conditions of the digestive tract. And you know, you can use anything for maybe two tablespoonfuls of aloe in the water up to maybe a teacupful. So you apply, if you wish, a water enema first, but no, just, you know, maybe the person has emptied their bowels, and then make up two pints with your aloe vera and apply it and hold on to it for anything up to 20 minutes. So you need to be in a relaxed situation and you may well decide to do it in the bathtub so that the aloe, the dilute aloe, can bathe the whole of the colon area and you can massage that again as you're doing it. But you wouldn't tend to use aloe vera in somebody who has a very cold um, digestive tract in that way. So it's a, a very good anti-inflammatory that you can use in that way. The next enema that we're talking about um, in our booklet is the coffee enema. Now, some people may have come across this when looking at the work of Dr. Max Gerson, and it probably is the most powerful detox tool for the liver. So if you imagine perhaps with people that you've done castor oil packing to the liver the previous night, you know, because this person um, is in deep trouble at liver level, then following it the next morning with a coffee enema can be so useful. And different people will use different amounts. Just make sure it's organic coffee, won't you? And that it's not too finely ground if possible. I tend to suggest to people that they use a gently rounded tablespoonful of this coffee. Put it into a saucepan, put something like half a pint of water in if you're just making for one enema, bring it just to the boil and let it very gently simmer for about 15 minutes with the lid off. Then take your jug and sieve your coffee liquid into your two pint jug or bigger jug. Then you're going to make this concentrated coffee 
up to the required amount, so be it two pints or a pint and a half, and you want to end up with that at body temperature. So then off you go. You've hung up your enema bag or your enema bucket, and you're going to go through the process we described, let the coffee run in. Now, really, this coffee needs to be absorbed by the hemorrhoidal vein. So you're not going to want it particularly, I mean, it doesn't matter if it goes across the colon because it can have a softening effect, but it's in the rectal area that the action takes place because it's going to be absorbed through the hemorrhoidal vein, go through the portal system to reach the liver. And when it reaches the liver, it will cause contraction of the liver. So here is this coffee, here is this toxic liver. So it's going to be absorbed through the bowel, straight to the liver, not meandering around the rest of the body. Cause contraction of the liver, which pushes the toxic bile out into the common bile duct, goes into the duodenum, works its way um, through there, go to the end of the small intestine, into the colon, and out. So this enema isn't given to wash out the bowel, although it will have that effect. It's actually given to detoxify the liver. When you do a coffee enema, you're going to stimulate what is called the glutathione pathway. And the glutathione pathway is one that will stimulate more detoxing in the body. So for some people, it's a great thing to do two coffee enemas, not in quick succession, but maybe if you do one one morning, then you would think to do another one later in the day or perhaps the next morning. Because you're not just detoxing the liver on that occasion, you're setting up another pathway for detoxing. So the coffee enema is an invaluable tool in your, um, your repertoire to keep yourself well. And uh, used to such effect by Dr. Max Gerson because he was so aware that people, you know, he was treating people very ill with cancer and tumours that were breaking down. And he realised one of the main causes of death was auto-intoxication. So as the toxicity was leaving the tumours or the cells in the body and reaching the liver, it would become very overloaded and would just back up. So he worked out with using all his juices to alkalise the body that he needed very regularly to stimulate the liver to squeeze, if you like, push that toxic bile out and wait for the next load of toxicity. So very, very powerful um, tool to use and is a tool that you would tend to recommend to people that they use within a programme because, you know, if people just became addicted to doing coffee enemas, they would have a depleting effect because your programme that you set up for people, unless they're just doing, you know, one a month to detoxify, etc., is that you would be making sure the diet is including anything that might be slightly lost. So that in Gerson's case, he wanted sodium out and potassium in. But he knew that the coffee enema lost a little bit of potassium. So, so many juices and potassium were used to match the large number of coffee enemas um, that he was going to use. The next enema you'll see is choline bitartrate. And this is just a white crystalline um, powder that you can buy, which is loose. It's quite a soluble powder. And choline bitartrate we do use by mouth as well. But if somebody wanted to avoid using coffee, for example, but they wanted to be able to open up liver cells, then I would suggest that this would be a good technique to use. And you can use anything up to two rounded teaspoonfuls. And the effect of this is quite specifically liver. It's amazing, I find, for people with nausea. You know, if they're suffering 
from any kind of hepatitis or nausea with ME, that type of thing. So instead of coffee, really, really good. And uh, you know, there will be some people who either don't want to use coffee or find this a more appropriate way. But again, with the coffee enema, you're going to hold it once you've used it. So you run in the coffee and you would hold it for 15 or 20 minutes, just like the aloe vera enema. So it would be a retention enema for up to 20 minutes. The same with the choline bitartrate. You wouldn't just put it in and then bring it out again. So you need to have found the best way for your you know, your position, be it in the bath or doing a water one first, so that you can actually hold on to these retention enemas because you need the, the hemorrhoidal vein, you know, which is wrapped around the anal area to absorb the pharmacologically active part of these ingredients and to take it to the liver to do its job. You know, we know, for example, that hemorrhoids are back pressure from the liver. So this congested liver picture. The next enema you'll see in your booklet is the chamomile enema. Now, coffee, we've talked about, you know, stimulating a squeezing, if you like. So it stimulates action in the liver. If we wish to sedate the liver, then we would use chamomile so that you would buy some organic chamomile flowers from your health food shop and make an infusion, you know, just as if you were going to make a strong teapot of chamomile tea. So put your chamomile flower heads in your teapot, pour on nearly boiling water, I would suggest, and just set it aside for a period of time. Then all that you need to do, again, is just sieve it into your jug, make sure that it's clear, and make it up to the required amount. Chamomile enemas have been used a lot at night time, particularly in France. It's quite a French technique, the chamomile enema. But Gerson used it during his treatment of cancer patients where the liver became overstimulated perhaps, and so he was using this for sedation. So just another form of retention enema, which actually has completely the opposite effect to the coffee. So it would be an antidote, if you like, to that. And you'll see in your booklet that you have some um, timings of how long to infuse it for and quantities. But, you know, that can be quite personal. The next enema that I'm going to mention um, is, is so, so useful. And this has um, a very deep effect. For example, if someone is suffering from a toxic migraine, and by toxic I mean where the liver is really overwhelmed and things are far, far too toxic and they may be feeling nauseous. A coffee enema is perfect. However, they may suffer a migraine where they're aware of tension building up their back, across their shoulders, and into the neck and occipital area. You know, this real rigidity. And it doesn't have to be migraine, you know, people having this tension in their body. Then a coffee enema would be not the thing to do. Absolutely not, because it's not going to serve the purpose. But the magnesium enema would be perfect, absolutely perfect, because magnesium relaxes muscles. So does potassium. Sodium and calcium do this, potassium and magnesium do that. So to put magnesium into the enema would be perfect. So it's a deeply relaxing thing to do. If you imagine cramping to do with menstruation, cramping of muscles which often people with ME suffer from, or just tension in the shoulders at the end of the day, or this headache coming on from tension, then I would suggest that you use magnesium citrate in general because 
um, magnesium sulfate, the Epsom salts, has a laxative effect. I mean, a little of that sometimes is good, um, actually, in an enema, but magnesium citrate, absorb, uh, mix that, dissolve that into the water. Again, into your jug, your two pint jug, off you go to the loo, administer it, and hold it as long as you wish, and you'll feel the effect of the magnesium relaxing the muscles and then you can just expel when you need to. The next enema that I'm going to mention to you in your booklet is flaxseed tea. Now this is an incredibly soothing enema, very useful for all sorts of inflammatory bowel illnesses. So in all forms of colitis and Crohn's, you'll find it very helpful in most cases. So you need to make your flaxseed tea and you need to thin it, obviously, to the point where it will run easily through the nozzle. So you require two tablespoonfuls of flax seeds and you put them in a litre of water, bring them just to the boil, and then turn out the heat, cover them over and leave them to stand for 12 hours. So it's ideal to do it before going to bed. In the morning, return them to the heat, bring them just to boiling point and then turn down so that they're just below boiling, just barely simmering and allow them to do that for an hour. Immediately put them through a sieve so that you're taking the seeds away from the gloop. And then you're going to thin this gloop to the right thickness and the right body temperature and then you administer that with the enema bucket or enema bag. I would suggest that you make sure that before you lie down to hold the enema for 15 or 20 minutes that you actually run some fresh water through your enema bucket or bag just so that the stickiness doesn't stay there. The next enema um, is an unusual one. It's a flaxseed oil enema and it's a technique that Budwig always used at the beginning of her treatments. And she used to use 500 mils of flax oil, but that can be rather expensive. And so I would suggest that 250 mils is actually enough to get it to work. So you need the oil to be at body temperature. And you're going to put that into your enema bucket or bag. But I would suggest that you have ready a bucket uh, or a jug rather, of soapy water because you're going to need to clean it quickly. So off you go to where you do your enema, lubricate yourself and allow this body temperature flaxseed oil to run in. So either 250 mils or 500 mils. And you're going to leave that in your body cavity, in your colon, for an hour. And then once you've let it run in, as I say, if I was you, take the enema nozzle out and run the soapy water through because it can make a real mess of your enema equipment. So there you're lying with the flaxseed oil in the rectal area. And what this is doing in there, it's your internal cavity. You are encouraging electron photon activity. So you are encouraging light into your body. And we know that when healing takes place in terms of tissue or the whole being, that more light is accepted and held within the body. So Budwig's um, way of working was to, if you like for an hour, flood that person with the photon electron activity, the light activity. She was bringing light in to the body cavity. And I have to say over the years, I've seen some quite extraordinary things happening where people, for example, may have had very, very stuck blood pressure and just opening up the whole process with light. So flaxseed oil enema, you wouldn't do them very often. You might do one and then a month later and then that be that. Um, people might do one a year, two a year, but it really is to magnify this activity of light in the body. What I would suggest also is that you follow 
um, you know, even if it's an hour later when you finished, but that you do a water enema just to clean the, um, the colon so that the oil doesn't hang around and become at all messy. But you can imagine that because this is inviting in light, that it may open up all sorts of activity in the body so that fairly soon after, the person may require something like a coffee enema, choline bitartrate enema, because all of this movement is going to perhaps overload the liver. But very, very, very powerful um, form of enema, as I say, very much based on Dr. Joanna Budwig's work. A, um, a technique which is again more commonly used in France is where we use what is like a mini enema. So it's a bit like a meat baster. And this is a technique that is so useful for people who can't utilize oil. You know, I found over the years that that's perhaps one of the most difficult things that the person may be suffering from low body temperature, dryness, all of that sort of thing. What I refer to as the conditions in the test tube. And so we want to bring their body to the point, particularly where they can utilize light, where each cell can have the benefit of light within and uh, this um, bio photon activity. And so what we can do is before bed is suggest a chamomile enema. So they make the chamomile enema as we've mentioned and put that in and hold that for about 20 minutes. Then eliminate it, excrete it and empty the bowel. And then they can put flax oil into the rectal area, anything from 15 mils to 60 mils. So it's better to have a little container like this that you use rather than putting a very minute amount of oil in your enema bucket or bag, it tends to get lost. And the idea is that this flaxseed implant is left in the rectal area overnight so that you are starting this electron photon activity from within a body cavity. And that can be very, very effective where the person can't use oil, so you might be using castor oil packing outside. You might even be rubbing flaxseed oil into the high lymph areas for absorption inside of the top of the arms and inside the top of the legs. But you're bringing the body status up to the point where oil could be accepted by mouth. So implant can be very, very useful. Anything from 15 to 60 mils. And, you know, occasionally it will be delivered back in the morning, but um, a lot of people will simply absorb it. So, moving on um, from enemas, we're going to look at something which I suppose you could describe as somewhat more elaborate. And you can buy um, this, which is the clismatic, which is a five litre container that you hang up on your wall so you get a good head of gravity. The fluid in it is fed through a pipe and ultimately to um, a tube, a nozzle, which fits under the toilet seat and so the person can sit on the toilet with like the enema nozzle um, in the rectal area and this five litres of water at body temperature is at a, a greater force, it's coming down and what the person does is to pinch the buttocks together so that this water goes into the colon and carries on increasing in volume in the colon whilst they keep the buttock muscles clenched. Then when they feel it's full and under some pressure, they release the buttock muscles and empty the contents of the bowel. And there's a one-way valve to stop the um, excrement soiling the water from the container. Then they allow the bowel to fill up again and then it's excreted. And so they can do that several times. 
The great thing is that they're sitting on the loo. So they're sitting in a good defecation position. And where I found this a very, very good technique <clears throat> is people with persistent constipation. Um, I can remember patients who had been having a lot of colonics because they had a really immobilized bowel due to being given Ativan for many years. And one of the side effects of the Ativan, the tranquilizer, was to cause this constipation. And so there seems to be something extra about the chlismatic, the head of um, water and the sitting in that posture and also controlling the buttocks in terms of defecation. Some people um, use them with some chamomile in, some people use them with some coffee in, um, but it really does exercise the colon, I believe, in a far better way than enemas do, or even colonics, because of the position of the person. And when you buy your chrismatic equipment, you've got it forever. And you can buy separate nozzles if more than one member of a family would like to be able to use that. So it can be a very, very good one for constipation. It can be a deeper cleanse if you're detoxing. Um, and as I say, not lying down like you are with an enema or having a colonic. So you're more involved with the, po the process than with the colonic. And then just finally, um, in this part of the technique session, I'm going to just look at colonics. Colonics the, they have many effects really. They're obviously effective in washing out the bowel because the normal procedure, and this is not with a pressure system, but with again the head of gravity, you use five um, gallons of water um, each time and you often use three containers and again you may have it slightly under body temperature you might have it slightly above depending whether you wish to sedate the colon or whether you need to stimulate it and again you may put different herbs or um, you know coffee or whatever in the colonic fluid and generally speaking the person lies on their left side to begin the process for the first tank of water. So they have been lubricated and a speculum used which has an input for the fluid and a waste pipe coming out. So the um, reservoir is opened and the fluid flows in and the outlet pipe is simply gently pinched off so that the water builds up and because they're on their left side it builds up and then is released and the fingers are removed from the outlet pipe, up and down, washing gently the descending colon. So there's this in and out, in and out. Then the person lies on their back, and then the water for the second tank can move in and out, in and out, across the transverse colon, and making its way down to the ascending colon. And then eventually the colon is cleared and the water hits the, the cecal area, the ileocecal valve um, area, won't allow it to go beyond there because that closes immediately if anything touches it. And then you often get um, an ileocecal flush where everything in the colon just rushes back out and out through the drainage tube. And, well, A, that's cleanse the colon, but really much more powerful is that it has stimulated, massaged internally all of the reflexes of the body. So as I mentioned earlier in iridology, the colon has every single organ, it has an area on its surface which relates to every single organ in our body. So the organ, the colon, will access the whole of us. And of course, if you're massaging in this way with water, it's giving the message to the body to release. So it's a very powerful detox tool. 
So for me, I believe it should be used within a programme. And what you will frequently find after a person has had a colonic irrigation, maybe the next day they need to do a coffee enema because you've had this huge stimulus for the whole body to let go. You know, a bit like fasting, and a clonic may be done within a fast, then what is loosened clearly mustn't overload the liver because, you know, all of the techniques we're looking at are ways of getting toxicity out of the body so they don't lodge somewhere else. So the coffee enema can be very appropriate to follow on from the colonic. Now, I'd like to introduce you to urine therapy. And what I found in my travels to different parts of the world, if you start talking to people of the right kind, you will find that all of the old cultures had urine therapy within it. And within this um, session, you'll see a lot of recommended reading so that you can look at some of the ancient masters of it and more modern books about it. So first of all, I really want to talk about using urine externally. So firstly, we need to look at how to collect our urine. And when we're using urine externally, we don't tend to use fresh urine. So we need to collect the morning urine. So your first specimen in the morning of urine is the one you want. And what is said is you, you dispose of the head and the tail of the serpent. So you clean yourself and you collect the midstream. So you pee a little bit and collect the middle part of the flow and not the last part. I suggest that you put it into something like a wine bottle. Use a glass bottle and put the urine in there. And then just very lightly put some cotton wool into the top. And then don't put it in the fridge. Maybe you need to label it well, but put it in um, a fairly um, dark corner in the house somewhere. And once that's three days old, it's ideal for use. So it's chemically changed. And in its chemical changing, it has the ability to draw inflammation and this means sodium, out of the cells. It's the quickest way to change the charge of a person's body because when the charge is wrong, we know that sodium, potassium, calcium and magnesium are in the wrong ratio. So to use urine externally when it's three to 10 days of age is going to have this anti-inflammatory cleansing effect. So how to apply it? Well, we talked earlier about skin brushing. So something that could be very refreshing, um, just in a maintenance way, is to skin brush and then to do a full urine body rub and then to do hot and cold showering. So to do the full body rub, you need to have your urine sit in your bathtub or sit in your shower cabinet and pour into a bowl some of the three day old up to 10 day old urine. Classically, you put it into a copper container. It was poured into a copper container because of course the alchemist knew that copper drew energy to the surface. Sitting there in the bath, cup into your hands the urine and start at the face and you rub until it rubs dry. So rub the face and the neck thoroughly to the point of dryness. So spend quite a time doing it. Then I would suggest you go down to your feet and you rub your feet, rubbing until they go dry and work your way up the body, the whole of the body, reaching all the parts you can, rubbing till dry and then re-rub the neck and the face. So you've got your urine on your hands. Don't put gloves on or use 
anything to rub with. It's the palms of your hand you want and your fingers and you rub your face, your neck, start from the feet and up. Remembering that face, neck, palms, soles of feet are the main outlets from your body. And ideally, you would rub for an hour, but you know, if you're going to do it once a week as a maintenance thing, you know, maybe 20 minutes, then do your shower and you can do hot and cold to finish. Um, so you might be suggesting this to somebody maybe twice a week to do a full body rub. And where it comes in very useful is if you have a situation where people could not do enemas. They may not be able to do it because they've had a colostomy or there's some contraindication from using enemas, for example, as an elimination route. Urine is ideal because um, maybe if they're taking something uh, like juices to alkalize their body, you would use the urine rubbing to all of the skin to draw the toxicity out. You can also use it as a pack. You know, we were talking about the castor oil packing, but it's amazingly effective if you pack your kidneys. Um, I've known people with nephritis where they've packed their kidneys and with an hour, within the hour, the symptoms are subsiding. And even if they don't have old urine, they can actually just pee what they do and place it there. Also, because our kidneys are the seat of fear and anxiety, if somebody is really quite traumatized, and I've noticed it particularly in people with things like ulcerative colitis, where the fear levels are huge, and you can hear it in the voice, that I'll recommend initially they pack their kidneys every evening. And you just, you know, have something about the size of a tea towel, preferably not dyed material, put the urine on at body temperature, place it on the kidneys, put something waterproof over, and keep it there until things feel cold. Don't put a hot water bottle there. Also, packs can be applied in all sorts of other areas. I've seen where um, women particularly have had lymph nodes removed under their arms, etc., that it's opened up through the skin, um, uh, you know, an elimination. So um, particularly um, strong, uh, uh, fluidy um, perspiration, if you like, that sort of thing, coming through the skin where you've had the blockages. Another area that responds very powerfully is the thyroid. So if somebody has a very sluggish thyroid, again, body rubbing and a pack there can be very, very useful. And if people um, find they don't have enough time to do a full body rub, maybe they do that once or twice a week. But on the other days, to rub the face and the neck can be quite um, relieving. It, it, it really is a, a, a wonderfully fresh feeling. Urine can be used almost anywhere. It's remarkable for earache. It's wonderful for the eyes. It's wonderful for sinuses. You know, if you wish to keep um, tissues soft, you know, to bathe the eyes morning and evening with fresh urine, which will be at body temperature. It can be very, very soothing and refreshing for tired eyes. And people, you know, students have used it for conjunctivitis where it's had an impact within the day. And as I mentioned, for the earache, it can be either the child's, if it's a child having earache, or the mother's urine that can be used. So a very, very useful thing. Remarkable for the hair, where in the morning you can pee into a jug, pour it over the head. Um, recommended that for a lot of middle-aged women or you know women who are going through the menopause. Then just wrap a towel around, leave it for an hour while you're making breakfast or whatever, and then go to do the normal shampoo. It has a very softening, um, very nice effect. And it should be something that's slightly acidic that's used on the head. You know, the Irish like to use very peaty water, so the urine has that sort of an effect. 
blemishes on the skin. I remember being shown um, a product by a young woman with, uh, with eczema on her face. And when I looked at it, it had urea in it. So it was a moisturising cream with urea. And so I was saying, well, I, you know, I'd rather use my own so that if people need to moisturise, they can actually mix some of their own urine with it. Um, can have a very good effect. And you see that most of the top um, cosmetics contain urea. Preparation of the breasts for breastfeeding. Um, in the old times, you always had creams given to you with urea. Well, it's a marvellous thing just to use your own urine there. And, you know, I've seen quite remarkable effects with eczema using it and then moisturising afterwards. So to use it externally, just to recap, is healing, but also it's cleansing. So you can use it to draw from tissue so that you're clearing out and you are creating movement because you have that effect upon the tissues. So that's urine, morning specimen, between three and 10 days of age. But if you haven't got any of that and anybody is suffering with their kidneys, um, you know, bladder infections, just use what they've passed as a pack placed over the kidneys. And then we could consider what is happening with drinking urine. And of course, many people in history have done that and a huge number of people you find are drinking their urine today. Um, remarkably, particularly in the theatre, I come across a lot of people who are doing that and they keep it quite understandably below the radar. So I would recommend for drinking that initially you just rinse your mouth with it and that's very effective for gingivitis. So in the morning just rinse the mouth out with it and spit it out and then some water can be used and then you can progress to gargling. And then when you get to the point of wanting to actually drink some I would suggest you drink something in the late afternoon when it's more dilute. So you would clean yourself, collect it in the midstream, and then just a little bit in the late afternoon. And you can build up the amount. When your body's used to that, then I would switch to the morning and do likewise. And you know, you do need to be very aware of this thing that I call push and pull. So that if you're drinking urine, which is your true vibration, urine when it leaves your body is sterile. And we know with homeopathy, we're treating like with like, but with isopathy, we're treating identical with identical. So it's absolutely your vibration that you're taking in. And if you're taking that in, you will ask, be asking yourself to change. So it will have the effect of creating a detox. And if you're doing that from within, it's always very important to be using urine rubs. So if you're going to take it in by mouth and you're going to create a strong detox, then you need to be using the technique of rubbing outside to pull out what is being loosened. So here you have a very, very powerful technique, a very ancient technique, and of course it's completely free and you always have it with you. And if you talk around about this, you'll have wonderful little stories told to you of where people used it um, with great effect. So a very, very useful remedy to have with you. So I do hope you found this DVD very useful. Everything that I've mentioned you can find in your booklet and you, as I mentioned these techniques are for giving energy and space to areas of the body that may be struggling and when we're asking our body to get better we're going to ask it to have more energy because we want to bring about change and that's not very logical unless we can help it in its roots of cleansing. So thank you.